You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and on this episode, I welcome Dr. Alan Broda. Alan received his PhD from NYU in music and anthropology, and like myself, he is passionate about helping doctoral students succeed. A former professor, he currently oversees operations at Dissertation Editor. And you know that whenever there is a backstory as to how a guest came to the show, I like to share it. I met Alan when I was asked by a university to vet a short list of companies to determine which ones they could confidently refer their graduate students to for editing services. We hopped on a call, and for so many reasons, I am excited to have him here today. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Please spend just a few minutes with you sharing the story as to how dissertation editors came to be. Yeah, absolutely. So I was finishing my dissertation. And like so many people, just didn't realize how many final hurdles there were. I thought, wow, I've written great chapters and this is good. Isn't it done? And then I find out there's this like long list of margins and headings and captions. And wait, what's the difference between Chicago author date style and APA? And so I just got all of a sudden launched into the weeds of figuring out all the technical details and ended up taking me quite some time and many trips to the library. I got it done and I was proud. And I also thought, wow, there's a lot of people who are probably really struggling at every step along this way. Um, whether it's the very end or the very beginning or how to talk to their advisor. And there should be more support out there, ultimately. My partner and I sort of realized that there were this group of people in need. So we started building a team, building a website, and launched Dissertation Editor um, just because there are so many of us out there. We're not alone, which is actually maybe probably the biggest takeaway for me in that process was realizing, why did I isolate myself so much trying to figure this out? I kind of, I kind of built the company wishing it had been there when I was working on my dissertation. Sort of like, wow, I wish, I wish, I wish that existed. Why? Well, why don't I? Why don't we make it? And so, kind of, that was the idea. And so it was. And, you know, Alan, I think that's why I have so much fun chatting with you, because that's how the Happy Doc Student Podcast and book came to be as well. Right. You see a need, you you fill the need. And I love that you brought up. It was at the end of your program. Oh, here you are. You're fatigued. You think you're almost done. And you bring up it's this technical aspect for many students. We'll get into all the different types of services that you do provide. But if we start with just editing, this is something that can take a lot of time, a lot of energy, and is very, very particular. Yeah. And and it requires uh, a skill set. You know, my main editor was, you know, my fiance and my mother were the two editors I relied on for my dissertation. And neither of them had ever read a dissertation before, had any idea what it was that I was trying to talk about. And, and yet it was still tremendously valuable and helpful. And, you know, and I, I will forever acknowledge them for, for that help, but getting someone else who, who gets it can really really elevate the way you communicate. And I think that's one of the things people look at at editing and they think that, oh, but that's not my words or 
you know, but this is how I wanted to do it. But it, it's not that at all because in the writing process, you get I get lost in the weeds. And I think so many writers do. And it's hard to see your own path sometimes. And getting someone else who has the time to really sit down with your your work and help you figure out, okay, what are you really trying to say here? Where is this going? It can be so incredibly valuable. And you know, Alan, I don't know a published writer who doesn't use an editor. <laughs> it is right? very difficult to edit your own writing. We have many episodes on this podcast about how it is so difficult to kind of remove yourself from your writing and really get it polished. But I know I probably have some listeners right now saying, but hang on, isn't that what my committee is for? And as a chair, as the committee member, I'm here to tell you, you want my time focused on your content, on alignment, on ensuring a strong theoretical background. Yes. You do not want me spending my limited time helping you with your passive voice, your anthropomorphism, uh, <laughs> how, how to cite a reference in text, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's such a good point because, you know, I think there was this, there was a different time in academia when your average advisor was advising two or three students and they were able to spend hours and hours on every chapter submission and dive into some of that nitty gritty if they needed to. They just can't right now. And if they are, like you say, then they're wasting time that they should have been spending on guidance of the overall themes and ideas and the progression of thought that's going through this paper, uh, not, not the level of the subheadings. That really should not be what they're doing at all. And I often say the name of the game in terms of finishing on time is reducing the absolute number of revision cycles you go through. Because every time your committee is kicking it back, you're revising, you're waiting for them to review it. So an editing service, having someone there that can help you really refine your work can shorten your time significantly in the program. I have seen this time and time again, and I'm sure you have plenty of stories as well. Yeah, you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So when you have a chapter draft and you're thinking, okay, I've got some ideas here. Let me just go see what my advisor thinks. Well, if your advisor is getting distracted by the passive voice and the anthropomorphism and that the figure captions are not done right, then they're not going to give you the better feedback that they would have on the content. And you're going to end up, like you say, with more cycles. Whereas if you present a chapter that is polished and professional looking, yeah, your advisor is going to be able to just focus exclusively on the ideas and quickly move you on to the next chapter or the next cycle. It definitely accelerates the process. There's no doubt about it. Before we started recording, we were talking about the issue of integrity. And I think it's a great time to bring this up because people might be thinking, whether you're a student or a faculty member, hang on, if I'm going to an outside service to help me with my dissertation or my doctoral project, where is this fine line between what's mine and what I'm writing and what they're doing to my work? Yeah, you know, academic integrity is extremely important. And you know, every once in a while, I do, I get a client or I get a potential client, I should say, who will call us up and say, can you just write it for me? And the answer is no. I'm sorry, we are not in that business and uh, absolutely can't. And no one should and no one could. That's the part that I think a lot of people fail to understand is that no one can write it for you, even if that was uh, something they could offer. because. You're going to defend your ideas in front of your committee. You're going to have to fully understand them and present them in a convincing manner. You're not going to get away with that any other way. And, you know, we built our entire company on sort of the notion of integrity. That's our, our core value as we 
are very strict about not writing any new content and also just being there to coach and guide and polish uh, the writing of students as they move through the process. You know, we also try to bring that to other parts of how we work in just the sense of we are real people. You know, we tell everybody our names when they reach out to us. They can see our faces and our backgrounds on our website. We believe in integrity and transparency. You know exactly what we're going to do before we do anything. Tell your advisor about it. There's no, nothing, nobody's hiding anything. We work closely with universities directly. Well, as you mentioned, you, your university was looking out to us. We partner with the University of South Florida. I go there for a webinar every spring and we work with their students throughout the year. And we've opened our, our office in London. That's starting to partner with uh, UK universities as well. And it's all part of our sort of global agenda to uh, elevate the efficacy of academic communication. We want to help students convey their ideas more effectively so that they can be more effective in the world. You know, not everybody is seeking a PhD to become a professional writer. In fact, most people are seeking the PhD to accomplish something perhaps even bigger and greater in the world. And uh, one of the greatest joys we have in, uh, in this work is helping those people realize those dreams. You know, the doctors of nursing practice who don't need to be experts in APA to become amazing nurses or to teach other nurses to be amazing, that we can help them or the analyzing the data of the VA hospital in New York during the COVID crisis, who, you know, were just trying to crunch the numbers to find out what was going on with the virus. Well, we had a team of statisticians that could help. And it's nice to be that, that auxiliary role that helps people do greater than they could on their own and feel that our skills are part of that. You said so much there, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this concept of integrity, because when I went to your website, I was floored that every single person on your team, I could see their picture, I could see what where their degree was from, I could read a little bit about them, and listen, everyone who's listening or watching this as a YouTube right now, buyer beware. There are people and there are companies in this space that aren't nice. And for else to say it, listen, if anyone offers to write content for you, that should be a huge red flag. Because like Alan said, you will have to orally defend this. You have to own this. Yes, I have been to dissertation defenses where the student has not passed. It happens. It happens when you don't own the work. This is simply a, a support system, right? right? And so that was one thing that really struck me when I went to your website. I immediately felt that transparency you were talking about. I know who I'm working with. I don't know if my paper is just being sent to some queue where someone who doesn't have a doctorate is reading it and giving me feedback and I'm paying good money for this. So that was really, really impressive for me. And you also talked about statistics. So when we started the call, we're talking about technical skills in terms of APA and getting the margins right and the headings. But boy, if you're doing a quantitative study, especially if you have no intention of teaching statistics or being a statistician, that can be a really arduous part of your dissertation. So how do you help students there? So this is another one of those great moments where I realized that lots of people do quantitative dissertations because I was not one of them, but we realized so many people did. And I thought, well, here's a need. Let me find some people who do know statistics, and then we're going to put them together. And it's just like you said, you know, that same, you know, educator going for an EDD in leadership does not need to be an expert in SPSS or in Vivo 12 or whichever software platform you need to analyze your data, you know. For most students, they're going to do that once and then never again. So 
there's no need to master those software platforms when you can have someone crunch those numbers for you and give you the tables that you need to convey your results. So along those lines, this becomes almost more of a consulting coaching role because they are going to help you crunch the numbers, give you the tables, but at the same time, make sure you understand right. what the heck it is that just went on because you're going to have to explain this to your faculty during your defense. Well, right. And you still have to write it. Just because you have a bunch of tables doesn't mean you have chapters four and five of your dissertation. So again, it goes back to that. We can't write it for you. You still have to say what it all means and you still have to convince your committee of what it all means. But all of our statistics services come with coaching sessions because we know that if you need our help to crunch the data, you need our help to understand why these analyses worked and those would not and so on and so forth. And, and typically students are working with us and with a methodologist at their university, right? So they're working with someone who is helping them figure out, okay, I need a Cronbach's alpha or, you know, two t-tests or a logistic regression as opposed to a legit linear regression. I've learned all these words. I don't know what they mean, but um, yeah, I know, I know. But I've learned enough. I've learned enough to be dangerous. So you know, they're, but they're, you're working with someone who's helping you figure out which of these analyses are are needed, and then what we're able to do is run the analyses. So we can take the data that you've collected. Again, you've also got to collect all your own data. You've got to submit your own surveys. You got to conduct your own research. But once you have that data, we can run it through the software for you. Um, and is the short version of that. And then we can talk to you about what the software did and why so that you can write all that up. And, you know, there's some really powerful tools out there that have emerged since I wrote my PhD. The things people do with qualitative analysis now is particularly amazing. My research was all interview-based and it never occurred to me to analyze the interviews with a software platform. But now you can take a series of interviews and turn anecdotal impressions of what people said into objective statements. 78% of men interviewed responded positively to X, you know, which I think is really powerful and is the way a lot of the research in that qualitative field is going as well. Um, so I know we were talking about statistics and now it's qualitative analysis, but it's all connected because it's yes. all part of the issue of, I have great ideas. I've got great research. Now what? And then we're in that space of saying, well, you don't have to do this alone and we can help you figure it out. And obviously with your committee. And, you know, as you were talking. I thought about the parallel of a, of a tutor. As we're going through our educational programs, whether we're talking bachelors, masters, if there's something that we're struggling with or doesn't come to us very intuitively, tutoring is very common. And right. a, a doctorate, most people do one for good reason. <laughs> so you've never done this before. And it would make sense to get that extra help. The other thing that I really, really was impressed by and that I really appreciated about your website is the comprehensive nature. So yes, I could have all my ducks in a row, get towards the very end, have my committee saying, listen, you need to get this formatted. You know, the university is not going to accept it like this in ProQuest. I could come to you for kind of, I like to call it the spit shine. Most of the work is done and I just need some help here. I'm not an APA expert. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. But you guys offer coaching up front, helping right. students uh, pick a topic, create their research questions. And I used to think, I, I used to believe, oh, coaching is really a service for doctoral students who are challenged or struggling. But I have to share this story that I worked with a student once. She was brilliant. She would get revisions back to me in a very timely manner, very articulate 
a, a great, solid, strong writer. She finished the program in record time, and it was near the very end. I asked her a question. I said, how did you think to do that? That was so creative. And she said, oh, my coach. I said, you had a coach this whole time? It, it would have been the last person I would have recommended a coach to because she presented herself as such a strong doctoral candidate. And she said, yeah, I, I wanted to really make sure that all my ideas were well thought out and well formed and that I was coming to you with a more complete product. Obviously, there's going to be revisions because the committee wants to have their say. But the number of revisions she did were so few and far between. And that was when I realized, wow, coaching really is for everyone. It, it really is. And, you know, thank you for bringing that up because we prefer to work with students early on in the process because uh, it, it drastically accelerates the time to graduation. When we, when we work with students, we usually pair them with someone who is then that's, that, that's your coach for all of the editing part of your dissertation. And then at some point, you'll need statistics help. And then there's one statistician. So you end up having a team with us, but it's a very small team. And we get to know your work and your writing. And so it becomes an iterative process. So as we're working with a student on their proposal, you know, they're making a lot of mistakes that we're catching and we're noting and we're pointing out to them. Well, those mistakes start to get fewer and fewer as they move through the process. In addition to having less revision time with their chairs, they're having less revision time with us as the work they're sending just starts to become cleaner and more polished. And they say, you know what? No, you don't need to look at my references. I, I got those now. I figured it out. Our, our sort of hallmark service is what we call our line edit. And that's, um, that's not the spit shine. You know, that's the deep dive where we're really making sure that every sentence flows well, that it has a consistent scholarly tone and clarity, and that we're giving you structured feedback on the argumentation of this chapter. Are these ideas flowing well? Are you repeating yourself? Is, is there something that needs to be developed or clarified here? And when a student can do that with us first, then they're not wasting their advisor's time figuring out the same things. And, you know, a lot of advisors have a lot of students and we can get that chapter back in a few days. And I remember waiting two and a half months for my advisor to review one chapter. And it's like, if you're going to have months of waiting to find out what's wrong, as opposed to a few days to find out what are the main issues, you know, you iron out most of those big issues with us, then sure, your advisor's going to say something about it. Of course, they're not going to say nothing, but they're they're going to say a lot less. And then those two and a half months won't have been in vain of waiting and waiting and waiting. And, you know, I'll tell you just from the human perspective, when I have a document, I open it up. If the first page is confusing, I, I see a lot of issues. Often I will close it and say, Heather, you don't have time for this right now. You're going to have to wait until you have a block of time. But if I open it up, and it's smooth and it's articulate, I can breeze through it. The, the well-written documents are getting returned quicker, which is kind of this right. catch-22, right? <laughs> because if you can create something that's more polished, by definition, you're getting done more quickly. And then you have a product that would be easier to revise for a publication. And I know you guys, basically, it's like a cradle-to-grave service that you offer. I like to think of it as like the a career launch pad, you know, I mean, the grave sounds kind of... It does. It sounds <laughs> but maybe like pipeline. soup to nuts. I don't know. Um, soup to nuts. I but, like that. Let's use that. Soup to right. nuts. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so many people don't finish in the sense that they graduate, but then they just let their research disappear, 
you know, and I ask the students, you ask anyone, how many dissertations did you read before you went to grad school? And the answer is almost always zero. And it will probably remain that way. So if you want to get your research out to the millions of people who don't read dissertations, you've got to make it interesting. You got to make it a journal article. You got to make it a book. You got to make it something that people want to read. A dissertation is written to demonstrate that the person who wrote it qualifies for the degree. It is not written to be a convincing and compelling exponent of research. You know, that is not the genre of the document. So if you want to do anything with your research, you've got to do it after you graduate. That is a huge point. I often am also saying it's a demonstration project. You have to hit your program outcomes. And then once they say, yes, congratulations, Dr. Fill in your last name, then you take that lump of clay that is your dissertation or your doctoral project and you refine it into something that's for the masses or for the researchers in your field in the form of a journal article. And this is such a hot topic, Alan. I am going to request that you come back and we do an entire episode on publishing if you're game. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's something that we do all the time and we work with lots and lots of students getting their books out there. And I would love to chat with you more about it. So I'll have you back for that. But usually I end an episode by asking my guests, do you have any final words of wisdom for the listeners or maybe a favorite quote? The first one that comes to mind is I tell people, look at your dissertation every day. I used to say, make it longer when you go to sleep than it was when you woke up, even if it's only a couple of words. But if you, if you look at it every day and add a little something to it, then what that does is it breaks the cycle of, oh, I just can't. And then it becomes harder and harder to look at it, harder and harder to bring it up. And a day of not looking at it becomes a week or two weeks or a month. And then it's hard to even remember where you left off. So keep your ideas fresh in your mind. Keep motivated, and most importantly, know that you're not alone. Get the support that you need. Don't languish in this forever. You know, I would never train to run a marathon without a personal trainer, and I think a doctoral journey could be similar, and you guys are offering that support. I will make sure all your contact information is in the show notes, Alan, and I look forward to having you back to talk about publishing. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Until then, if you're looking for more ways to invite joy into your journey, check out the free resources at expandyourhappy.com. You'll find downloads like an article I wrote titled, The Doctoral Journey, 12 Things You Need to Know That They Probably Won't Tell You. Based on audience requests, There is a PDF that organizes all podcasts by the seven steps detailed in the Happy Doc Student Handbook, which you can also find on the website. And if you're looking for Happy Doc Student swag, I've got that too. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel. And if you want to make my day, rate and review so that together we can change the way graduate education is delivered and experienced. Hey, one more thing, just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.